All right, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to Black Minds Matter, a focus on black boys and men in education. My name is Luke Wood, and I'm a professor of education at San Diego State University, and I'll be serving as your professor for this course. In this course, we seek to raise the national consciousness about issues facing black boys and men in education. And in doing so, what we're doing is looking at patterns that we see that the Black Lives Matter movement has raised to, to really national consciousness as it relates to overcriminalization of black boys and men and undervaluing of their lives by those who are sworn to protect them, namely police officers. And what we're doing is we're looking at those patterns and then translating them to see how those same patterns are evident in educational settings as well. So we'll be talking back and forth between those in today's a lecture, we'll, we'll get to that point. But before we do, I, I wanted to just kind of give an overview of the framing for this class. Essentially, what we're doing here is we're looking at what we call the D3 effect, the three primary ways in which black boys and men are viewed in educational settings. So the first way that they are viewed is through a lens of distrust. So through this lens, we know that they are viewed as criminals, viewed as deviants, viewed as being up to no good. And today's session will focus intently on what that looks like, what the research says, and again, drawing parallels between what we see in wider society and what we see in the educational research as well. We're also gonna look at a pattern of what is referred to as disdain. As it relates to disdain, what we're looking at are the ways in which this population is pathologized, viewed as being lazy, viewed as being uncaring, deficit perspectives about students, their families, and their communities. One of the common examples that my colleague Frank Harris and I give when we talk about how these patterns look like in community colleges is we note that it is not uncommon for us to hear from faculty members in talking about black men that, well, you know, they're not really here for school, they're just really here for the financial aid. So th these negative perceptions that oftentimes had about this community. And then the last one is disregard. Disregard the intelligence and worth of this population as it relates to what they can contribute in the classroom. And again, this D3 effect will be the focus of, of this class, but we'll be talking first, primarily today, looking at distrust. Again, for today, we have Ryan Smith from the Ed Trust West, who will be participating with us. We have an interview with um, Esley Merritt, who's a prominent civil rights attorney. And then we'll be joined by Patrice Kohlers, who is one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter. So in addition, I uh, would also like to thank some of the partner organizations who have made today possible. There are a number of organizations, so we'd like to acknowledge them for their con contribution. One is the Education Trust West. Um, again, our first speaker is, is from that organization. In addition, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, Moms of Black Boys United, Mob United. We'd also like to thank Instructional Technology Services, who has made this room available to us. And we can also, of course, have access to the Learning Glass, which is a, a wonderful technological feature. Uh, Our Scholarship Matters, which I'll, I'll talk about um, in a few moments, um, but they're an apparel company that focuses on social justice-related wear. And then the Center for Organizational Responsibility and Advancement, CORA, which provides online professional development training focused on better preparing teachers, faculty, and, and those who work in student services to better uh, teach, support, and educate uh, black boys and black men. We'd also like to thank uh, the number, a, a lot of individuals who have been instrumental in helping to put together this course in terms of coordinating sites, um, in terms of content. So first, uh, Darielle Blevins, uh, who is a PhD student in the joint PhD program in education uh, here uh, at San Diego State University, which is a joint program of Claremont Graduate University. A number of students in the room who are part of that program as well. So if you're interested in it, if you'd like the kind of work that we're doing here, we are a racial justice program. Uh, look further into what we do and see if we might be a good fit for your learning. Uh, Lauren Como, who is a master's student in the community-based block program. Karan Jane, uh, who's to my left here. Uh, who is a master's student in computer, computer science. Suwa Zhang, who is our lead research associate, he's a PhD student. Uh, and uh, Fatma Afalaj, who is a video editing student. 
um, who's getting ready to graduate, Ari Lerner, uh, who's also helped us with video and editing, and then three other individuals who really have helped us with the technology part of this um, in terms of being able to deliver this course, uh, Sean, Koo, and Antonio. So we'd like to begin by just talking about what is the inspiration for this course. So, and I'd first like to begin by noting that this course was inspired by a report that was released by the Education Trust West called Black Minds Matter in 2015. And this report looked at experiences and outcomes facing black learners in California, trying to provide a context for what um, can the state do to better support uh, this population. And again, we'll have Ryan uh, Smith, who was a, an author on this report and key thought maker as it relates to some of the recommendations here with us. But I think what's important is that the report, while it's California centric, has I think wider applications in terms of what needs to take place nationwide. In addition, I'd like to show you another individual here who served as an inspiration for this course. This course owes its origin, origins to the man you see on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, and this is Alfred Alongo. Alfred was a refugee from Uganda who came to the United States at the age of 12 with his family who was seeking to escape a regime that wanted to kill them. He was a father, a husband, and he worked in the food service industry and he had hoped to own a restaurant of his own someday. Last year around this time, he had experienced the loss of one of his closest childhood friends. A few days later, his sister noticed that he was not acting like himself and called the police for help. The police responding to the scene were not part of the psychiatric response team, though that's what the request was for. When everything was said and done, Alfred was shot by the police and killed. He was unarmed, like so many before him. After the, the slaying of, of Alfred, uh, individuals in our community, particularly our black PhD students here um, at SDSU were heavily involved in direct action as it relates to marches, protests um, throughout, the, throughout the city of San Diego, uh, particularly in El Cajon, which is where this occurred. And as part of the conversations that came out of that, we were discussing how can we show how these patterns that are taking place as it relates to what we see in society also take place in education. What can we do about it? And so this course is really response to their request to really put a highlight on how black minds are oftentimes undervalued and criminalized in our educational settings. Lastly, what I would like to do at this point uh, before we move forward is to um, highlight the, the public syllabus. If you go to my website, which is jlukewood.com backslash BMM, uh, there you'll see the public course syllabus. On this syllabus, um, you'll see a number of different things that I'm going to run through as part of, of, of kind of giving an overview of this. So again, if you haven't gone there, go to jlukewood.com backslash BMM to access the public syllabus. In addition, what I would like to do is say a few things about what we see in this syllabus. So looking specifically at um, the introduction to the course. And so I'd like to just read the introduction to the course because I think it helps to frame what we're trying to accomplish here in this program. There have been many high profile slayings of young black men. Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, Austin Grant, Grant III, Alfred Alongo, and far too many others. Anger regarding these slayings has led to numerous marches, protests, and vigils throughout the nation. Rising through the power of social media, the Black Lives Matter movement has shed light on the injustices facing black communities and has provided a statement of affirmation that black lives do indeed matter. Shadowing this movement, there has been increased discourse about the status, experiences, and outcomes of black students in education, particularly black males. Black Lives Matter has shown that black boys and men are devalued and overcriminalized in society. These same patterns are evident in educational settings, leaving, leading to overrepresentation in special education, exposure to high rates a suspension and expulsion, and ultimately feeding the school to prison pipeline. Similar disparities are manifested in college and university settings as well. Black Minds Matter is a public course designed to increase the national consciousness about issues facing black boys and men in education. The course draws parallels between issues faced by black males in society and the ways that black minds are engaged in the classroom. Through this lens, we will engage research on black students in education, from preschool to doctoral education, emphasizing strategies and practices that can support their success. The course employs three tenets of the Black Lives Matter movement, loving engagement, collective value, and restorative justice as a framework for enhancing outcomes for black boys and men in education. In particular, the course encourages educators to see their classrooms, offices, schoolyards, and campuses as sites 
for civil resistance. In an educational setting, civil resistance is manifested most powerfully through teaching that empowers the disaffected and communicates love. As stated by the late Asa Hilliard, I've never encountered any children in any group who are not geniuses. There's no mystery on how to teach them. The first thing you do is treat them like human beings. And the second thing you do is love them. This involves embracing a new educational paradigm that truly values the intelligence, worth, and morality of black minds. As a person of faith, my approach to civil resistance is rooted in the adage, love your neighbor as yourself. As educators, we have the privilege of educating the children of our neighbors. Therefore, we must embrace their children, not as strangers, but our own, as our own. Love your neighbor as yourself and love their children as your children. Teach them with love, discipline them with love, build personal relationships with them as love as if they were your own. In addition to this on the course syllabus, you'll also see that we have highlighted what we believe are absolutely essential works if you're doing any work in this space, either as a policymaker, a practitioner, a researcher, we would say that you have to have read these pieces as really to have a good starting point for engaging in work on black boys and men in education. These are hyperlinked on our website to the publicly available sources that we could get them from. So we would encourage you to be able to access that. Lastly, before um, we transition into the first interview, what I would like to do is just mention one of our, our partners, which is Our Scholarship Matters, which again, provides social justice where that's focused on advocating for issues that are important to to underserved and minoritized communities. They have been incredible in helping us advertise this course, uh, providing us with uh, apparel such as t-shirts and tote bags and things that we've been giving away and to try to publicize and gain more people to be able to participate. In fact, I'm personally wearing one of the shirts that came out of this, which is called Black Minds Matter with the fist. And for each week, you'll see different ones that, that, we'll, be, that we'll be wearing as part of this, just to uh, thank them for the incredible support and, and money that they've provided to help this course be uh, delivered publicly. So at this point, what I would like to do is to transition to an interview that we pre-recorded in, in advance of this class with Esley Merritt. For those of you who don't know, Esley Merritt is a civil rights attorney. And he was the attorney for the family of Jordan Edwards and numerous other cases that have been high profile slayings of young black men and police brutality cases. He's been incredibly successful in his work in this space. And so what we'd like to do is to show you an interview that we conducted with him in advance of this course um, to basically look at this topic. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Luke Wood, and I'm a professor of education at San Diego State University. Welcome to Black Minds Matter, a public course where we seek to raise the national consciousness about issues facing black boys and men in education. In this course, we will feature many interviewees and guest speakers who will talk about their work as it relates to black boys and men in society and also in education. Our first guest speaker is S. Lee Merritt, who is a civil rights attorney and frequent television commentator. Lee Merritt has served as the attorney for the family of Jordan Edwards, as well as many other high profile cases that deal with issues facing uh, black males, particularly um, looking at criminalization of black boys and men. Uh, Lee, thank you for joining us and being here today. Thank you, Evan. So uh, for those who may not be as familiar with uh, some of the great work that you've done, can you give a little bit about your own background and, and your involvement, particularly as it relates to the case of Jordan Edwards? Sure, I'm a civil rights attorney based out of uh, primarily Philadelphia. I licensed practice in the, uh, at the state level and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and in the state of New Jersey. However, the bulk of my practice is focuses on uh, federal law or constitutional violations. And uh, with regard to federal law, I spent a great deal of my time down south, uh, in particular the northern, north, uh, western region of Texas. I have an office out of Dallas where I handle uh, primarily police brutality cases and mm -hmm. some corporate discrimination cases, any case uh, that is derived from constitutional violations. And so I was first introduced to the Dallas area uh, in 2016, in July of 2016, when a sniper uh, killed two or killed five Dallas police officers and injured others. Mm. Um, at that time, uh, I, a movement leader, Mark Hughes and Corey Hughes, were accused of being the Dallas sniper, and their image was blasted all across the internet uh, in, in a way that I believe to be reckless and to be really consistent with law enforcement treatment of African Americans exercising their Second Amendment, uh, Amendment right. You're immediately criminalized. 
lives. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Hughes brought a gun to the rally uh, to protest the assassination of Philando Castile, who was a legal gun owner, who was a gun legally when he was killed by law enforcement. And so he brought a gun symbolically and himself almost became a victim of the same thing that he was protesting. Uh, since then, as you mentioned, I've uh, had an opportunity to represent a veteran who was harassed at a corporate um, restaurant on Veterans Day, told that he wasn't a real veteran on an issue that sort of went uh, national because of a video that was taken, or viral because of a video that was taken of the incident. Uh, I've represent Jacqueline Craig, a woman who called the police when her neighbor assaulted her son. Instead of properly dealing with that issue in Fort Worth, Texas, the officer attacked uh, the mom, Ms. Craig, arrested Ms. Craig and her two teenage daughters. Um, I represent uh, this family of several slain young men. Uh, in fact, between, I believe, April and June, uh, yeah, between April and June, there were three 15-year-olds killed by law enforcement across the country in a matter of 30 days. It was a really rapid clip of to see boys that young being killed by law enforcement unarmed African-American males. Uh, I represent two of them, uh, the family of two of them, Barry Smith, here in Southern California. Where I'm visiting now, where I'm from, and uh, Jordan Edwards in Walsh Springs, Texas, a suburb of Dallas. Uh, in addition to that, in, in addition to that, I've done some cases where there was Miss Black, Texas, who was arrested by a police chief in uh, Commerce, Texas. Uh, since had the chief removed from his position of chief of police for Commerce Police Department, uh, I represent most recently. Um, DeAndre Harris uh, out of Charlottesville, Virginia, and he was a young man who was um, assaulted by a group of Klan's member and neo-Nazis, um, severely beaten uh, following the Charlottesville rallies. Wow. So, um, unfortunately, the climate of the, of the nation right now keeps being pretty busy. Yeah, I mean, the, the tension is very sharp right now, and it's only seeming to heat up as a school year for us here in, in higher education uh, begins and, and continues to move forward. How did you get into um, this work into, in terms of being a, a civil rights attorney? Well, I was born during a very interesting time. I was born during, uh, I was born in South Central Los Angeles uh, during what we call the Rodney King era, uh, some might even call it the Cochran era, uh, where police tension and community tension was also at, a, uh, what was at the time had been an all time high. I believe that it's uh, a lot more heightened today because of what was unique about Rodney King's uh, brutality case is that someone was able to carry one of those big, huge camcorders and catch it on film, uh, which was very rare back then. You saw the brutality uh, of the Los Angeles Police Department, in particular the Rampart Division, unleashed on a completely defenseless back male. Now, if they were allowed to spin their own narrative, they would have said what they always said. Hey, he was resisting arrest. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in fear for our lives. He refused to comply, and so we had to use this amount of force that it was appropriate. But uh, upon watching that, the nation understood that there was nothing appropriate about that force. Uh, we see that a lot more often now uh, because everyone has a camera. You don't have to look. You know, 45-pound uh, uh, cameras everywhere. Everyone has a pocket camera in their, in, in their pocket. And uh, so we catch behavior, police behavior a lot more often. It becomes readily uh, available to the public. But and, and, and can I ask you a question about that? Because one of the things I hear people say is that things have gotten worse. Is it that things have gotten worse or that we just have more cameras out there to witness what has already been taking place for so many years? Yeah, no, I, 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 I think that's exactly it. It's, it's that things have always been really bad. Police culture in America is, to be clear, the most violent, the most deadly police world culture in the modern world it has been for a very long time. And it has everything to do with this auspices being rooted in slavery and, and, and fusion of slave laws that our policing system was not designed to protect and serve as it claims, but it was designed to maintain a system of white supremacy and the structure of slavery. And that system grew into the police force that we know today. Uh, they claim it's more lives than comparable nations, nations with uh, similar equal population sizes, similar equal gun ownership sizes, similar equal crime rates. Uh, for some reason, our, our, our police are frankly more trigger happy, uh, more likely to use deadly or brutal force than any other one, uh, any other police force in the, in the world. Uh, except for, uh, at the time when I was growing up, uh, apartheid South Africa. So apartheid South Africa had a similar system of race-based policing. Um, and I had heroes growing up, like Lotsu Stephen Pico, who mm -hmm. died by police brutality and 
Nelson Mandela, Patrice Lumumba, uh, and all of those really heavy influences as a child. Uh, they really inspired me to get into the kind of work, coming back full circle into the original question is how, how I got into the work that I'm doing. And of course, I grew up under the shadow and idolizing uh, Johnny Cochran to build his career on police brutality cases in Los Angeles. So, you have been very successful in fighting the cases that you that you've taken on. What has separated you from some of um, your you know fellow lawyers who haven't been as successful in in facing and, and taking on a criminal justice system that we know is is not designed for us to be able to to win? Quite frankly, I just don't think a lot of people are doing it. Um, it's there's not a lot of money to be made in the civil law. Uh, and after you invest the kind of time and energy that goes into law school, do you want to pay off those school debts? Do you want to you, know, you want to earn a comfortable living? Uh, and because of unity laws that currently exist, and some that are coming down the pipeline, and the, the sheer difficulty that, that of uh, proving uh, that an officer has done something wrong, there's an, an inherent trust in most of the Americans of law enforcement. And so you spend years investing in a case that seems as open and shut as they come. Mm -hmm. For example, Jordan Edwards, you have a 15-year-old uh, in the passenger seat of a car who was driving away from a bad situation, a party that apparently, uh, at least because of the police presence, had not come out of hand. And so they were doing exactly what they were supposed to do. They were driving away. They did not pose a threat to anyone. An officer took a right point, fired five rounds into the car, killing mm -hmm. this straight A honorable stupid you would think that case was as open and as shut as they know. I mean it would seem <laughs> but it's been fifty years in the state of Texas since an officer has been indicted, let alone uh convicted of any crime. And there have been crimes of similar uh facts that somehow they were able to get away with. And we've seen that frustration play itself out in cases of Orlando Castile and Austin Sterling and a whole litany of other cases. So there's no presumption in in, in uh, that that you're going to get a win. And so, uh, quite frankly, most lawyers can't afford to uh, take on that kind of risk when, you know, corporate negligence, quite frankly, is an easier sell. It's a lower standard. Uh, it's uh, less immunities. Uh, you don't have inherent trust. People are uh, inherently less uh, uh, trustworthy of corporations, but they believe, um, for the most part, even in the face of, uh, clear evidence to the contrary what a law enforcement officer tells them. Yeah, that's true. To answer your question, I think the key to uh, my moderate success would be just to take on the fight in the first place. I've decided that this is what I want to do, and if it's difficult, uh, I will do it anyway. Well, you've been blessed with success, and we hope that you uh, continue to be successful because you're doing great work. In, in this class, what we're doing is we're linking themes that have been identified um, through really um, these cases, in particular, looking at the undervaluing of, of black bodies by law enforcement, those who are really sworn to protect them but oftentimes do not, and looking at the overcriminalization of black boys and men. And we've been taking those same themes and translating them into an educational settings, looking at um, how those same patterns play out in terms of how teachers oftentimes view students as being lesser than, how they're assumed to be deviant, up to no good. Uh, nefarious and then how that results in over uh, representation in special education, subjection to exclusionary disciplines such as suspensions and expulsions. And you know you're someone who's also you know traversed the educational system. you're you're a lawyer, um, you have extensive training. Uh, do you see parallels between those how those uh, factors play out in wider society and how they also then play out in educational settings? I absolutely see the parallels. I've had, I guess, I've traversed it three times over, myself as a student, uh, and I've been expelled from school at least two times before I made it to high school. Um, wow. and, um, I saw a path being set for me, a path that my older brothers were going down where they were uh, expurgated and not allowed to continue at normal schools, ended up in juvenile programs, and ended up to a, uh, in a life of imprisonment, release, re-imprisonment, et cetera. Uh, and so I was able to catch on early on that if I if I didn't do something extraordinary, if I didn't isolate myself, if I didn't uh, get mentors and people, I, I really went around begging people to mentor me because I knew I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in jail as my father did, as my brothers were. Um, and then I graduated, and the first job that I took out of Morehouse was a teaching position. I did Teach for America. 
mm -hmm. one of the most dangerous uh, uh, cities in America, Camden, New Jersey at the time. And um, I saw how quickly, number one, I, and I talked to law enforcement officers about this, about inherent biases, how quickly I uh, punished young black boys. Because I said, if I want to maintain control over my classroom, then I have to identify the problem and snuff it out. It's something I had learned in um, military school, something I learned in leadership in general, uh, that if you rule with a heavy hand, uh, then you can uh, facilitate a more orderly classroom and be more productive. Uh, well, for me, because I was raised in the same American culture as everyone else, even as a black man who considered myself semi-conscious, uh, when I look back at the data in terms of what behavior was taking place, was being punished for young black boys in my classroom were being punished more severely uh, for the same behavior as other people because I had inherent biases based on my being raised in an American culture. They told me to be weary of, to be fearful of uh, black men. Something that I noticed with this crisis that's going on in Houston right now, um, the uh, the media, social media, and TV began to show images. Immediately, they said the looting has begun. Who did they show? They show black men reaching into cash just to take money out, and reinforce this norm: black men are dangerous, that black men are criminals, and that black men need to be controlled by a system of incarceration. And the third time that I tra traversed the system is I, my oldest son is seven years old, mm -hmm. and he suffers from a mild form of autism. He's been diagnosed with a mild form of autism. Uh, that it has everything to do with how he views authority. Now, my son's mom is a doctor. His dad is a lawyer. We're both uh, deeply invested in his education. He has every resource available to him. But after one year in school, they were ready to put him out of school um, because he was undiagnosed at the time and place him into a continuation school. And of course, I was able to catch it early on and say, you know, that this is not a punishment issue, that, uh, that there were a thousand other uh, avenues to pursue before you went to uh, penalizing him for his, his characteristics that he had, uh, could not control and that um, you know, a stiffer hand couldn't control because I consider myself a pretty strong, strong arm dad. Uh, but there are thousands, uh, millions even, of young black men who don't have those kind of safety nets, who don't have a father and a mother who are in the picture who can say, you know, you're not going to criminalize my son as a kindergartner. Yeah. Uh, I understand if you went into that program as a kindergartner, they built prison systems based on the population of the schools that they were trying to send them to, continuation schools that they were trying to send them to. Yeah. I believe those were, it was laid out in Cornell West's uh, book, Winning the Race, or it might have been called Losing the Race, but he, he explained the direct correlation between our um, school to prison pipeline uh, and the, the um, industry that is that is our, our the American prison system. Yes, I mean the the we do know that the prisons are built upon um, rates of placement in special education, fourth grade le reading levels, and a number of different factors. Which unfortunately they're building prisons for us, um, and that's that's what's taking place. And What's crazy to me, I mean, as a, as a father, I have three children, and I do have a son who's also in early childhood education, and to have someone say to you about your child and not even take the time to look at them as a, I'm guessing this was in first grade or kindergarten when this took place, to make this statement to you and, and that early on, this is what we think of, of them. When it had been another child, they probably would have taken time to figure out what's going on because they would have cared. There would have been more empathy there. And the tough thing is a lot of times we have educators who think, I mean, they really do want to care, but they just have been socialized, like you said, we've all socialized in this society where unfortunately black bodies, black boys and men are, are oftentimes just undervalued in that way. Yeah, that was really scary. Yeah, it is. So I wanna, I wanna ask for your advice in terms of uh, those who might be viewing this, we know that there's going to be a lot of individuals who are who are parents. Uh, in fact, we're part partnering with a, a parent organization, Mom, Moms of Black Sons United, and they're uh, doing circles uh, and talking groups with with parents. Um, what advice would you give to them, um, both in, in both contexts, and looking at this criminalization piece in terms of what what they need to do to prepare their sons for society, um, where they'll be engaging officers who will unfortunately engage them in, in ways that are, are not going to be the same as they engage other individuals. And then also, kind of secondarily, 
What would, advice would you give to them as their sons end up traversing through an educational system that wasn't designed for them either? Um, well, we have this ideal of an American judicial system that hypothetically is based on laws and um, it judges individuals based on the action of their character versus the color of their skin. And we've heard this idea, we know that it doesn't play itself out in practical reality. And so what do we do? Well, when the law or when the enforcers of the law are exercising um, uh, uh, their positions in a way that is biased, that is uh, disruptive to our culture, to our children, uh, we must hold them accountable. Uh, and so we've heard of a system in, in New York, I believe, a practice of what's called broken window policing. And anytime someone broke a window and they treated it with the same severity and the same seriousness, they would investigate that crime the same way they investigated a murder. Uh, and it sent a signal to the community uh, that we don't allow broken windows. So you know we're not going to allow larceny. You know we're not going to allow robbery. You know that we're, we're not going to allow homicide. Uh, I think we can. Uh, uh, it's a terrible system. Right? Yeah, I was, I was, I was waiting. I was like, oh man, that's awesome. It's a great detriment of the African American community. Uh, but I think we can borrow from that. Okay. Uh, when we are illegally stopped uh, in search, uh, we don't complain enough. We don't file formal complaints with the department, which I agree for the most part are useless. Um, we don't file lawsuits, which I understand can be expensive. We need to learn, uh, we need to educate ourselves how to become pro se litigants, we'll bring lawsuits on our own behalf. Uh, we need to take on every single fight as if it was a wrongful death suit. Um, because uh, that's the only way the system will have a record that it's happening. Because a lot of times, if you look at statistics, for example, of policing, which is my primary area of practice, uh, only 3% of police encounters result in any complaint whatsoever. And so if you ask the uh, United States policing system how it's doing, uh, it would say hey, we had 97% of we doing an A-plus job uh, in policing African-American citizens. When you and I know that's not true. Um, yeah. But there's uh, until there's a record, until there is people challenging them, even for the little things, um, uh, then we'll see them continue to get away with some of the bigger things as well. And so my first piece of advice is to not tolerate discrimination. For too long, we've become far too tolerant of discrimination um, in our own homes and for other people. I recently had a case where a man was permanently disfigured uh, because after um, uh, a, a reasonable suspicion stop or uh, with a law enforcement officer, it turns out he had some outstanding warrants, gave the officer a false name and he ran away. The officer put out her taser gun and shot him in the back lost consciousness, fell to the ground, causing severe um, uh, abrasions to his face. And our culture immediately said, Lee, don't take on that case. That's not the kind of case you handle. You handle a truly innocent. This guy is a convicted criminal. He has warrants and he was running away from the police. Well, he was running away from the police based on uh, an unlawful stop in the first place. He had no reasonable suspicion to ask him uh, any questions. He didn't want to go to jail because he had finally gotten himself clean. He had gotten employment. And if he went to jail based on a warrant, which he could not afford to pay, yeah. and gone to the jail two weeks prior and said, I have these warrants, can I come and send them out on the weekends so that I can keep my job? They said that was not an option to him. And so he ran. Uh, when someone runs, there's certain tactics that you can't use, and certain tactics that you can't use. You can't hit them in the back of the head with a really club. You can't shoot them in the back. Uh, if he doesn't pose a danger to, your, to the officer or to others, you can't fire a taser to his back and cause him to lose consciousness and be permanently disfigured. But our culture says they don't take on that fight. Um, he's, he, he, we don't value ourselves enough to stand up for that person. Um, unfortunately, I can only get people to rally behind clients like Jordan Edwards, who I call the perfect victim. Um, and if, if, if we believe that we are entitled to the same freedoms as everyone else, uh, then we have to believe that for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, both, uh, again, what, what we allow for ourselves and what we allow for others. I, I'm a big uh, encourager of community-based uh, living, so you have to invest yourself in your community. Uh, when I was a teacher, I made the point to live in the community that I taught in, to church in the community that I taught in, to shop in the community that, uh, that I taught in, and really find yourself invested in, in, in your community. Um, I attended an HBCU because although I know I, I, uh, that the culture of America is a predominantly white culture, uh, there's certain uh, certain things that you can learn about uh, 
love of self and appreciation for one's culture and a sense of responsibility for one's culture that you, you learn by surrounding yourself constantly with your community. Um, and so while, while everyone eight out of 10 in HBCU, I do think that we need to invest our children in programs, schools, local schools, possibly charter schools within their communities uh, instead of private schools where they're awaiting uh, from their community or um, uh, abandoning public schools, which seems to be the trend under the new administration. Um, uh, in, in every aspect, in every opportunity we have, I started a mentoring program when I was in college, that, and the whole mission was to get children that we work with a sense of ownership and responsibility for their community, help them prop them up for success. But they had to remember something that we lost at the end of segregation when we desegregated, desegregated our society, our haves fled to other communities mm -hmm. and blended in those communities uh, that have a strong culture that, uh, that is not rooted in the black experience. And so we lost something and that I think we can begin to reclaim. Absolutely. So is there any way that um, that those who are listening can, can support the work that, that you're doing, uh, particularly as you take on some of these cases that, as you say, might not be viewed as oh this is the, the the perfect person to defend but as you said if we don't defend all of these in a way that that does justice to it then we're only going to um, allow ourselves to to further be um, brutalized as a community how can people support you in the work that you're doing part of it is just having an ear to hear uh eyes to see uh, on their own independently the media will make a portrayal of information uh, mainstream media will make a portrayal of information that, that fits a narrative that is consistent with what we want to see. There's something unique going on with social media uh, that the world hasn't adjusted to, that we can report our own news, uh, that we can hear our own stories, that we can we are in the, we can become uh, in the driver's seat for the release of public information. So you can follow me uh, on Twitter, you can follow me on social media, you can follow social activists that you trust to provide news that is not spoiled by the narratives that um, our, our systems, that our powers that be want to spend um, and, and, um, and join in a local organization in your community. Um, what we're learning with uh, the Trump White House and with um, the uh, Sessions Department of Justice um, is that we can no longer rely on the federal government fight our battles for us, yeah. or to operate in our best interests. Uh, in fact, they often become a common enemy, unfortunately. And so we need to uh, take ownership in our local city councils, uh, take ownership in our, our local school board, school boards. Uh, uh, we need to join uh, forward-thinking progressive organizations. Uh, Sean King and I are partnering to develop an organization called Woke Folks. Uh, his title. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's called what again? Woke folks. Okay. Woke folks. Okay. That will allow uh, people from different backgrounds and trainings and experiences to uh, promote our work in their system. So I rely on my woke cops uh, to give me perspective on cases. I will rely on my woke teachers uh, to help deal with troubled students. I rely on woke business people uh, to uh, create jobs for people who have been discarded by the system. And so if you want to join that organization with us, you can find us on Facebook, just follow. We're in the, building, we're on the, we're in the process of building it as we fly. And so if you just follow us, you'll get information as it comes available. Well, consider me a woke person for education. Sure thing. Sure, Luke, uh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. I, I wish the project much success. Likewise, thank you for joining us. Our next uh, speaker, and we are very privileged today to have the author of the Black Minds Matter report, Ryan J. Smith. Um, Ryan Smith is currently the executive director of the Education Trust West, a research and advocacy organization focused on educational justice and the high academic achievement of all California students, particularly those of color and living in poverty. Under Ryan's leadership, the organization continues to expand its work with a focus on producing actionable, accessible research and advocacy tools that reach state policymakers on the ground, community uh, advocates and education, and education leaders alike. Since taking the helm of Education Trust West, Ryan led the team's development and production of the 2015's Black Minds Matter, supporting the educational success 
of Black Children in California, a, retort, a report championed by the California Legislative Black Caucus and leveraged by state and local education leaders, students, and other advocates. Ryan also guides the organization's strategic work to better serve communities fighting for change at the local level, leading to the Education um, Trust West launch of the inaugural Community Data and Research Hub in Southern California. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn it over to Ryan. We're gonna have, provide him with some time to get some comments as it relates to the report. And then if you have questions that you'd like to pose to Ryan, what we'll do um, at, towards the end of his presentation is pose those questions to them. So just again, use that hashtag Black Minds Matter, post the questions on Twitter, and we'll go from there. So with that, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, well, uh, good evening one and all. This is, this is the most technology I've seen in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be intimidated by it. Uh, my name is Ryan Smith, and as Dr. Wood said, I have the honor of being the executive director of the Education Trust West. We're a policy research and advocacy organization dedicated to educational justice. And I'm excited because we're actually on the eve of the anniversary of the Black Minds Matter report. So in four days, it'll be two years since we released the report. And I'll talk about some of the impacts, but we're really excited. It's a report that's rooted in a call to action just to support black students, really inspired um, by the BLM movement um, and, and really speaking truth to power when it comes to things like systemic institutional racism. But before I begin, I do wanna thank a couple people. Number one, I just have to thank uh, the leadership of Dr. Wood. Uh, for a number of reasons. Not a lot of people uh, show the type of courageous leadership necessary to champion the needs of black students and black boys. Um, we have a lot of people who talk about it, but not a lot of people who are about it. And to see the leadership and the inspiration of doing this, not only doing a course here, but making sure that it's online so that people nationally can really engage is a powerful testament to the work that we need to do as we think about how we turn the curve on some of the devastating data we see on boys of color. So, you know, at home and in this room, let's give him a round of applause for his leadership. I also have to thank his lovely wife, who without her, I would not be here because I got really lost on this campus. So I appreciate you. Um, I did have to run, you know, I couldn't keep up with her. She was running and I was like, okay, I may, if I, if I have a heart attack, just, just do the uh, lecture without me. Just let people know um, the importance of this issue. So um, I'm going to go through a little bit of the. I'm going to go through a little bit of the PowerPoint uh, around some of the data. Um, but I'm excited because not only has this work and uh, this work actually been championed in California, but we're starting to see nationally people thinking about well, what do we need to do when it comes to the needs of uh, uh, black students. So I will begin the presentation. There you go. So this was, uh, it was released in 2015. We're on the eve of uh, the anniversary of the report. Uh, once again, uh, I have the opportunity to be the executive director of the Education Trust West. We are a policy research and advocacy organization. We are majority person of color research and policy organization. We're a majority uh, woman led uh, organization as well. And that's unique in the research and policy space. And I just have to give it up to my team. I have an amazing team of researchers, educators, community organizers, um, activists uh, who gave up lucrative careers to really fight the good fight and see that we close opportunity gaps in this generation. So I am excited about their work. Bayard Rustin, who was the architect of uh, the March on Washington says, every community needs a group of angelic troublemakers and I have the opportunity of working with a really amazing group of angelic troublemakers each day. So what we think is different when we talk about uh, our work is we're really about democratizing data, bringing data to people. We take research that is um, based in California and we work with community-based organizations and leaders across the state in order to make sure that that work is being disseminated. And I will say this, you know, Huffington Post had a really good article that said, um, academics could change the world if they just stop talking to each other. So we think about why have, what's the, uh, what's the need of a, a think tank uh, that elites are talking to each other? We need a think tank for the people. 
we need a campaign about data for the people. And really the uh, core of the Black Lives Matter report is about democratizing data, particularly as relates to black students. I'll give you a little bit of my story. I graduated from UCLA, go Bruins. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I will say this, I actually went to UCLA the second year after Proposition 209 was passed, which ended affirmative action in California. So UCLA had the largest class it ever had, 4,000 freshmen. Out of the 4,000 freshmen, I was one of 27 African-American men who got into that campus on academics alone. When the chancellor did the orientation and said, look left, look right, one of you will not be here. Well, all the black, we were all, all the black men were sitting together during orientation. So out of the 27 of us, if the data panned out and it did, only 13 of us would graduate in four years. That really led my belief that we must do something different when it comes to black students and particularly black male students and started some of my activism on campus to repeal Proposition 209. And that experience threads a lot of experiences that bring me to you today. Let's start here. So the late great Julian Bond said, violence is black children going to school for 12 years and receiving six years worth of education. When we think about the call to action, particularly the women and the men who've led the Black Lives Matter movement and saying this system, this incarceration system was created, designed to house black bodies. We have to say on the other side of this that the education system was built to not educate black children. In fact, in this state, the state was a free state. In 1850, black children were not allowed to be educated in California even though this was a free state. And the reason I bring that up is because we have to talk about how systems have been designed. This isn't about the talent and belief of all children. If you don't believe me, watch Hidden Figures. You will see that all children are brilliant and black children are certainly brilliant. But this is about what we've done, what obstacles we created to ensure that our children are not as successful as others. This was the, uh, so we released the Black Minds Matter report in 2015. This young woman is actually a young woman from Oakland um, who is the cover of this. And this really was an image that showed us that, yes, there's a call to action about this. What we said in the report is the deaths of unarmed youth by law enforcement across the country tell young black men and women that their lives uh, matter less than other lives. And the experience of black students in school tell them that their minds may matter less as well. And we looked at some of the data here in California and I'll also talk about the national data as well. But we will say in this state, once again, considered a progressive state, black students are more likely to be suspended and expelled, more likely uh, to be identified for special education, particularly black young men are over indexed when it comes to special education, particularly as relates to uh, being uh, identified as being emotionally disturbed. And we know that uh, black uh, students are more likely to take re uh, remedial uh, courses in college that are high school level courses that they are paying for, but are not actually receiving credit for across this country and in the state. We know that black students are less likely to be placed in gifted and talented programs. That's true in the state and across the country be given access to a full sequence of college prep courses and graduate from high school in four years and college within six years. In this state, and Dr. Wood was talking about uh, the connection between uh, reading levels and what uh, beds were building in jails and prisons. In California, only one out of four black boards are meeting standard in readings in reading last year. Only one out of four black young men were meeting standards in reading. And the interesting thing about this state and other states is the only way we know this is because a reporter actually asked the state to release information because they actually don't cross tabulate the data by race and gender in the state. So this is not something that's well known. A reporter had to basically 
uh, sign a legal document saying you must give us this information in order for us to know that in the year 2017. Since 1980, uh, we know California has built a total of 22 prisons and only four public universities, 22 prisons and only four public universities. And this is Oracle Arena. I live in Oakland, um, so that's the uh, the home of the world champion Golden State Warriors. I'm a Lakers fan, but you know, I'm, 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 I'm giving this for my team back in Oakland where we're headquartered, but that's Oracle Arena. So when we talk about, you, all of us have been in arenas and they are similar sized across the country, but think about sitting in a seat in a basketball arena and think about this in this progressive state that the number of California Latino students and black students who don't graduate with their cohort in, uh, in in four years could fill that arena three times over. Talk about data for the people. So here's some of the results of the Black Minds Matter report as we are looking at the second year anniversary. We saw 1,000 students march to the Capitol after we released this report, and I'm gonna show you some pictures about that in a minute. The California Legislative Black Caucus hosted a series of briefings, not only in Sacramento, uh, but up and down the state saying, we need to do something about the crisis in black student achievement. And two years later, after all the work of folks like Dr. Shirley Weber, who's an amazing legislator um, and others, the California Department of Education actually launched an equity office to turn the curve on the data that we see. And that shows you that when we actually focus on something, we can get results. Here are some of the pictures of the Black Minds Matter rally that happened in front of the State Board of Education. We saw once again, 1,000 Black and Latino students wearing young Black and gifted shirts saying this, you need to be held accountable. This education is my education. And it was a really powerful example of what can happen um, when folks focus on what matters. And here's a picture of the 1,000 students together. Now let's look at the nation. We do have to celebrate success. High school graduation rates are up for young black men and that's something to applaud. It also shows that when we focus on something, we see results. But there's some things that we need to be concerned right now. Black, um, black boys are perceived to be as, as uh, older and less innocent than white boys at the same age. And we know that from a lot of research that we see. We know right now uh, that black, boy, well, black boys are more likely to be suspended and expelled. And we know that there's a connection absolutely between pushing out these students and uh, incarceration rates. And we know it starts early and research shows the correlation. In fact, um, Pedro Noguera, who I believe is actually gonna be a guest speaker here, and actually Dr. Tyrone Howard, who you're gonna bring is an Etrus West fellow this entire year too. So we're excited to see the connections. But Dr. Noguera just spoke and at Equity Summit that we did here in San Diego. And you may, in his book about the trouble with black boys, he says black male, uh, males are overrepresented in every category associated with failure in American schools and underrepresented in every category associated with success. Let that sit with you. Every category. For a young African-American man at the age of 34, without a high school diploma, he has a 68% chance of being incarcerated. With a high school diploma, that number drops to 20%. And with a college degree, guess what that number is? Virtually non-existent. And we did some research, actually our national partners at Trust has done some research about black male teachers. Uh, and I have to give it up for Dr. Ashley Griffin and Dr. Travis Bristol, who do amazing work looking at uh, the needs of teachers of color. What we saw when we saw black male teachers talk about their work, we saw that they say that they can build connections 
with black boys and girls and how important that is. But in the profession, they're seen as the disciplinarians. They're not chosen uh, to teach AP courses and honors courses or to be looked upon for advancement. They're asked to be the ones who are actually expelling and suspending the very students who look like them. And then when we talk about uh, our college students, black male uh, students nationally uh, are graduating with a BA, about 21, 20% uh, 20 of them are actually graduating with a BA. I will say this for our Latino brothers and sisters, particularly for our brothers, only 10% of Latino boys actually are graduating college with a BA. We have work to do. So some people will say, well, aren't you talking about poverty? Isn't this an issue that black parents don't care? And we hear that and we need to talk to that. Um, and I could go in on, on poverty, we won't go there today. I will say this, that we see research that says the opposite. Number one, a study in Houston shows that uh, black parents are more likely than other parents to check their child's homework. And we know a national study found that black parents are most likely to value college. So there's a counter narrative to what we assume to be the reasons why this is happening. So let's talk about why it's happening. So it's writer Vu Lee that said, equity is the new coconut water. You've ever heard of educational equity? How many of you guys have heard of ed equity in this room? The majority of you, we talk about it often, but it's the trend we're all talking about and not everybody is necessarily drinking. How many of us have seen this picture at some point? Show of hands, probably a lot in the audience as well. Well, this is a great example of equity, but there's some problematic things here. Number one, our students aren't different sizes. Our students come in the classroom brilliant. They're all the same size. They all have the same talent. It can't be that some are taller than others. That's not how the system is created. Actually, the problem is the fence is higher in other places. We built walls that are larger, that are harder for people to see over in some places than others. And unfortunately, it's for people of color and low-income people that they're still trying to see over uh, many of those obstacles. But not only that, equity can't be about um, us staying outside of the game, watching it from the sidelines. We're talking about equity being a means of freedom, meaning we need to make sure that we have enough money to watch the Dodgers of the World Series. Go Dodgers. We need to have enough money to be able to provide opportunities for the next generation of students and families. Equity is about making sure that the data that we see right now will never happen again. It's about reverse. It's about the recognition of disparities and actually providing the resources necessary. And it's something that I'm sure uh, Dr. Wood will continue to talk about as this goes along. And then when we see really quickly when schools and systems make the right choices, how things change, how equity doesn't have to be the new coconut water. So let's look at San Diego State. It's nearly doubled the number of black student graduates in the last 10 years. And one of the reasons they said that is, hey, we realize we have a problem here. And they start to focus and look at the data and they start to get results. Now, we still have a ways to go, but the fact that they said they have an issue and they wanna do something better shows you that when we focus on results, things happen. The last thing I'll say is there's a school in Compton, Laurel Street Elementary School that I have to give props to. Laurel Street Elementary School has nearly uh, moved its black student achievement uh, ELA numbers by 20 points because they said we can be better than the state average. And that principle is dedicated to ensuring that black students and all students actually can thrive. So I'm gonna end right there. We can talk about solutions. I know that Dr. Luke and I will talk a little bit about it, but I will say this, if ever there was a time to focus on results, if ever there was a time to think about how we support students, if ever there was a time to call out institutional and systemic racism, to call out our own unconscious biases towards black students, and we all have them, now is that time. And I'm excited that you're starting to do that in this uh, in this course. So thank you. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate that.
So um, the first question that came through was you showed the rates about reading for black boys. Mm -hmm. Though this class focuses on black boys and men, do you know what those rates look like for, for girls and women? You know what? So I, I will say that I don't know the top in the state of California. I will, I will note that I know that they're higher than that for black boys. But are they still disparate? They're, oh, absolutely. And the gaps are still large. And even in our report, which you'll see nationally, because I think it's important that we talk about the needs of black boys, but let's not say that black young uh, girls and women are, are doing that much better. And we know the gender gap um, and pay shows that even uh, as black women are gaining degrees, they are not receiving um, the type of equal pay necessary to close economic gaps. But I will say this, let's talk about suspension expulsion. Black young girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls mm -hmm. across this nation, six times. So this is an issue across the gender spectrum um, and we need to uh, make it a call to action for both boys and girls as well. Okay, thank you. The next question says, what can we do as a community to help as, in terms of taking responsibility for helping to basically fill some of those gaps that you're talking about? Yeah. And, and specifically as a, as a black community. Yeah. yeah. So I think, and, and I alluded to this earlier, it's time for the black community to reclaim this education thing. And, and, and I give a good example because I do think about um, Hidden Figures, the movie, because it's, it's a good access point. How many of us in this room have seen Hidden Figures? And, okay, good. If you haven't seen this on demand, <laughs> go see it today. Because of the, if these young black women in the segregated South who graduated from awesome eight historically black universities, but had to deal with not only, uh, not only racism, but sexism, can go to NASA and be called human computers and actually compute the, the, the launching trajectories and landing trajectories of men on campus. You cannot, uh, pardon me, in NASA, you cannot tell me that black people cannot do math. You just can't tell me that. But we, as a community, have believed some of the things the system has told us about ourselves. Historically, we are a community that has embraced education, yet we find ourselves in a country that has not always provided us the opportunities to thrive. So the question becomes, if we're building a movement to dismantle mass incarceration for Black students, or pardon me, for Black people, it's time to build a movement to ensure that all black students, no matter where they come from, have equal opportunity. And that's going to take us marching and doing what's necessary to make that happen. Absolutely. And one of the things we're talking about in this class is to view our roles as educators, to see our classrooms, our offices, our schoolyards as sites for civil resistance. And some people are confused when they hear that, like a civil resistance, what does that mean? And you know, in our community, we have a long history of engaging in civil resistance. If you think about the civil rights movement, there were marches, marches there were sit-ins, there were vigils, there was protests. I mean, there's ways of basically through peaceful actions demonstrating that, hey, what's taking place isn't what it should be. And I think as educators, one of the most powerful tools that we have for that civil resistance is teaching. Teaching in a way that empowers communities that have been disaffected. Um, so I think that we, we have to keep that in mind that, that we have a responsibility to continue to push um, against what we see. Next question comes in and it says, um, can you talk about some of the intergenerational trauma that sometimes faces our, our boys and men of color? And the, this is looking specifically as it relates to foster care, but I'll say just in general, if you could talk about it more broadly. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, I would say black, uh, black children, and of course, black male students are over indexed when it comes to being in foster care and kinship care. Um, and we see that across the country. Uh, we know that there are issues with poverty. We know there's issues with housing. We know there's issues with joblessness. And all of that absolutely feeds into the data that we see. And we know there's a lot of work around social emotional learning that's thinking about issues of trauma. Um, I will say this though. Um, we have to meet our students where they're at. And when we have the conversations around trauma, we have conversations around grit, it's not about these, something being wrong with our students. It's about knowing that and how can we support them when they get in the classroom. And I will say this, uh, you know, a child who is traversing five gang territories on the south side of Chicago 
or in South Los Angeles is the grittiest child you ever find. So you can't tell me that child likes grit to go to school every day. But it, the question is, how do you bring that into the classroom? And that's the conversation that we need to have. And I think it's an important one to have as well. Absolutely. As someone who's a former foster youth, I, I mean, I, I relate to the, to the question. Um, and I think it's important for us to keep in mind that we have students who are experiencing varying levels of trauma, whether it's um, external pressures, whether it's internal pressures that they face in the classroom. We can't ignore that as part of the conversation because trauma is part, unfortunately, of the black learning experience. Um, the next question comes in and says, are you familiar with the concept of stereotype threat? Um, and if so, do you believe that's a factor in some of the outcomes that you were talking about? Absolutely. So um, two things. One, we recently released a report in June called Hear My Voice on Strengthening the Pipeline for Young Men of Color. Uh, and in that report, we talked about stereotype threat. I also think about uh, the book Whistling Vivaldi that specifically mm -hmm. talks to uh, the needs of stereotype threat. Absolutely. I think um, we are succumbed by the way that people uh, perceive us. And that is over time where it, it, it provides... Um, it provides obstacles for the way that we view our own success. We have to talk about things like stereotype threat. We have to talk about things uh, like institutional systemic racism. And I say this in education because it's important. Mm -hmm. I think we talk about other systems like housing and we talk about redlining. We talk about mass incarceration and we talk about the criminal justice system. Um, we, we talk about all these other systems. When we get to education, we seem hesitant to talk about racism because it doesn't exist. Well, we're all well-intentioned but we know that the roads of hell is really paved with good intentions. Mm -hmm. And we know that we have to call out issues of systemic institutional racism and things like stereotype threat and create spaces for educators to your point around civil resistance to have those conversations safely and freely, no matter what your background is. And I don't think we've done that yet in education. We're, we're scared to have the conversation that needs to happen, but those crucial conversations around race must happen if we're ever gonna close gaps. Absolutely. So the next question says, and we'll take this I think as the last one, what advice do you have for non-black educators who teach our, our black kids? Yeah. And, and let, let me also, before you answer that, I wanna also chime in on that last one. Uh, I think it's important for us to keep in mind, and this is something that you'll hear throughout this course, because we recognize that unconscious bias, stereotypes, microaggressions, it's part of the pervasive experience of our children of color and our black boys and men in particular. And I think when we think about that, you know, sometimes it can get to a point where we're, we're demonizing those individuals who are rendering that. But from my perception, everyone is biased, right? Being biased doesn't make you bad, it makes you human. But choosing to do nothing about that bias, that's what's bad. And so it's about, again, when we started up the course, like what are the, our prerequisites for the course? It's accepting responsibility, right? Accepting that, hey, I, I, I'm falling short. Here's the th things that I, I recognize, I have bias. Um, I'm, there's things that I'm doing that are not ideal. And then saying, okay, based upon that, what can I do better tomorrow? And in reality, if everyone were to take that perspective of responsibility, we'd be in a totally different place than we are. Yeah, I'll, I'll just allow him to mic drop that right there. I mean, the only thing I'll add, <laughs> not much to add is we desperately need allies. We know that um, we don't have enough educators of color to, 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 to lead this work. So we need to recruit, of course, more educators of color. But this has to be. And that's at all levels, at right? All levels. Pre preschool, elementary school, middle school, high school, community college, university. And it's, a, it's at every level. Absolutely. And as I said, the, the work of. Uh, Dr. Bristol and Dr. Griffin show that this is needed. You know, the other thing I'll, I'll, I'll say is, um, you know, if ever there was a time when you, when you see people who are holding up signs down the street that are spewing hate messages, or you see uh, LGBTQ students who are being bullied uh, online, um, if you even see, because we don't, we don't talk about this, but we know a, a, a large percentage of uh, people who are undocumented in this country are black. <laughs> so when you're talking about looking at undocumented uh, folks who have to look at the news to see if they can still go to college, if ever there was a time for all of us to collectively come together and say, how do we take responsibility 
for these students now is the time. And I think this conversation is a good place to start. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. We're, we truly are just so grateful for you giving us some of your time today. Um, for You're in the car, and I know that you're on your way to, to Lancaster. Um, can you talk about, um, just as you're driving, um, what you're on your way to do right now as part of the work that you're engaged in? Yeah, well, I just want to first thank you and all the tremendous work that you have done to bring such uh, brilliant Black folks together to discuss um, some of, I think, some of the most pressing issues that scholars should be discussing during this time. I know you got a lot of flack because of it um, from the right. Um, you always know we're doing something something good and righteous when the right goes after us. So I'm just, I just want to honor the work that you've been able to do. Um, appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm on my way to Lancaster, which is... Um, a suburb in LA County that historically was very white. Um, we have some of, I think, the the, uh, the largest um, neo-Nazi and Klan organizations here in the Antelope Valley. And um, uh, in the last, I would say, 20 years, because of gentrification and the rise of, um, of uh, mass criminalization in LA, many Black families have moved to the Lancaster Palmdale, Antelope Valley area. Um, and for some of the black folks and the Latino folks in the um, audience probably know, um, have family in the Antelope Valley um, and it's, it's the desert. Um, what we've come to realize in the last 20 years, wherever poor black people are, um, heavy policing exists. And so the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, which is the Sheriff's Department for the entire county, they're also in charge of the LA County jails have been at the forefront of criminalizing communities and the housing projects here, um, setting up DUI checkpoints, um, have been um, some of the uh, folks who have killed multiple families here. We had a killing just most recently of a young 17 year old. The sheriff claims that the bullet ricocheted off of a dog, off of a sheriff dog and um, went uh, and killed the young boy. Witnesses say the sheriff actually killed the young boy in broad daylight that was, you know, the boy was about 10, 20 feet away. Um, and then um, I think the last piece for us is we are really trying to build out um, a campaign that pushes for um, uh, uh, divestment from criminalization and uh, an overhaul of the way in which we've used monies and dollars um, for black communities um, and push for a, 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 a reinvestment into our communities. And so I'm going to um, do a town hall. This, this area is very neglected. So many people don't travel out here to even um, to meet with the community. And so there's gonna be three families, two of which were, were killed by the sheriffs on the streets, one family whose child was killed inside LA County jails. Um, and we're going to have uh, meet with lots of community members and groups who have been trying to get the um, to be heard by elected officials about what's happening out here? Well, that's powerful work, and thank you for what you're doing. I know that it it takes a lot uh, emotionally, physically, to be engaged in the in the work in the way that you are. So, thank you for that. Thank you for updating us on on what's going on there. Um, in terms of this course, what we're doing is we're focusing, in particular, looking at Black boys and men in education. But really, I mean, I think we're we're passionate as you can, and if um, as students heard in terms of the speech from Ryan, we're really looking at, at, at issues. Can you talk about how the movement, the Black Lives Matter movement has been intentional about advocating for people of all genders, including those who identify as male, female, transgender, gender nonconforming? Yes. Um, you know, it was very important for us as we helped develop the Black Lives Matter movement and also the Black Lives Matter Global Network to have a more, um, to have a, a, a conversation about all black lives um, and to also understand the multiplicity of, of black people that um, we, we were never um, uh, constructed to just represent the gender binary um, and that blackness is actually um, queerness, uh, black is queer and, um, and that uh, many of the freedom fighters that we 
have um, loved and adored are Black trans people. Um, they have shaped our understanding um, and um, shaped our uh, sort of, you know, dialogue, our, our, our modern dialogue around um, queerness and transness. Um, and that um, so much of our movements have often been led by Black queer people in particular, but um, we were not allowed to be out about it. And so um, really challenging this notion that the only way we could talk about Blackness is only talking about Blackness, um, but rather there's um, the intersections of Blackness, um, Black poor people, Black queer people, um, Black trans people, Black people who have conviction, um, convictions, um, that these uh, black people are are an important part of the dialogue if we're really going to talk about and dream about freedom. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. You know, in in this course, what we're doing is we're focusing and drawing parallels between how black people are policed and how essentially they're policed in in, in very similar ways and similar patterns in schooling contexts. Any thoughts on on that based upon the work that we've done? Um. Can you ask that? Can you ask that question one more time? I didn't hear you very well. So, so in this course, we're drawing parallels between issues facing uh, Black people in policing and and also showing how those are patterns that are very similar to the way that they are approached and dealt with and engaged in education. I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts. Ah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, um, some of my first work um, as an organizer and activist was actually taking on the Los Angeles School Police Department. Um, I think there's an interesting history that we have to look at when it comes to um, deindustrialization in this country and the, um, and the, uh, the pushback against unions, deindustrialization, and then what um, actually came into its place. You know, a lot of us, a lot of people talk about the fight against private prisons, but that's not where um, criminal, most criminalization is happening for Black people. It's happening in, in public um, and public, a public institution. So if we're talking about the educational system, um, what often has been replaced um, is uh, Black and brown people, in particular poor people, being trained um, in, in trades. And now, um, instead, you know, we had a campaign called um, uh, um, pre-job, uh, pre-med, not pre-prison. And that um, the current public educational system has actually shaped itself around um, the carceral state. And so um, our one of my first campaigns with, in challenging mass criminalization was around um, challenging daytime curfew law in Los Angeles, which uh, many people didn't know that um, folks were going to school and, um, and instead of uh, getting, uh, you know, uh, welcomed into their campus, they were receiving uh, $250 tech tickets for being late to school. Um, and this, you know, was shaping how um, young people, young black people in particular, understood how they were supposed to relate to school, which was like, I don't want to go there. That place is um, hostile towards me that place is detrimental towards me. And so um, I think we have to think about how we are um, imagining and practicing spaces that are supposed to be spaces of care and spaces of education. And, and instead what they're turning into are spaces of criminalization. Mm, that's real, very, very true. And we're, we're gonna talk about some of that more coming up here. Uh, so you you have been very engaged in in community action. Can you, can you talk about how how do we engage community in changing policing and other policies that adversely affect Black communities? Mm, I mean, I think you know before Black Lives Matter, a lot of my work was about talking about divestment and uh -huh. Black community and Black communities. And one of the big things that I noticed is that um, uh, in those conversations, Black folks were really clear that they didn't want policing, but they didn't know what else could exist. And so part of the role of an organizer is um, not just, you know, I think we have sort of this understanding and view of, of activism, which is like protests and being on the news, but actually there's a lot of steps in between. 
And part of those steps are to actually engage Black communities, um, whether that's by, you know, um, just sort of like your run-of-the-mill civic engagement, going um, door-to-door knocking, um, you know, meeting folks at bus stops, meeting folks um, at the barbershop, and having a new conversation about what we deserve. And I think that's been an important um, Okay, I think we may have lost her for a, a moment. Let's give it a few seconds and see if it, she comes back on. Uh, and Okay, looks like we lost uh, some. I'm back. Like okay, there we go. <laughs> we we're, were, we're, were worried. We're like, where, oh. did, <laughs> where did you lose me? Um, what was the last thing you heard? When you were talking about divestment as a strategy. Oh, damn, that was a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was talking about building black power. So. Um, and I think part of how we build Black power is um, actually uh, working on um, having conversations with Black people. Um, and in those conversations with Black people, um, developing, um, helping Black folks develop new tools around how we, what we imagine for ourselves and what we imagine um, in, 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 in this work. And so what, what, I, was, what I was saying is, we're sort of living in a culture where organizing is understood as, you know, um, going to a protest or being on the news, but there's all this in between around organizing. And what's, what's the in between is having those regular conversations, showing up to barbershops, showing up to salons, uh, meeting people at bus stops, meeting folks at the corner, and really trying to help build leadership to change the conditions of Black people. I, I don't think we're going to get free with a, a bunch of activists um, going to protests and marches, which I, I, you know, I frequent often, but that's just one tool, one tactic that's among amongst a larger strategy. And, th and that definitely makes sense. I mean, we have to, we have to be multifaceted and really uh, when I, when I hear you talking about this, it reminds me of a concept from critical race theory called interest convergence, where if you really want to change the paradigm, you have to basically, use strategies that reach the interests of, of the dominant majority. And oftentimes that's, uh, you know, when you're talking about divestment, it's reaching, if it affects their pocketbook, they'll think differently. If it affects what comes out of their pocket, they'll definitely think differently. So thank you for, for sharing that. Can, can you talk a little bit, and, and we kind of probably could have started here, but in, when you, in terms of the founding and the kind of maybe in the evolution of the Black Lives Movement, can you talk about how the movement has evolved um, o over time? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, this is one iteration of the Black liberation movement. I think that's actually really important for, our, for folks, for the audience. Um, black folks have been fighting for freedom and our allies have been um, helping us fight for freedom uh, because they see it as a part of their freedom journey as well since uh, for the last 500 years. Um, there's always been resistance. Um, there's always been a movement. And um, sometimes there's an uptick in which, uh, who, who knows, right? Who knows when, when those uptick, upticks become sort of like central, but sometimes there's central moments and we're, in, we're living in a central moment right now. And I think uh, what we're seeing in this moment is um, a new understanding of what blackness is um, what it's not. I think we're seeing some old tactics like um, the FBI deciding that there's going to be a new identity for Black people, Black identity extremism, right? Um, yeah. A new homeland, uh, new identity for Homeland Security to to be, uh, to sort of dig their fingers in. Um, we're calling it COINTELPRO 2.0. Um, but what, we, what we've seen over the last four years and the growth of the, of the movement is a movement who's, um, and I don't want to talk hyperbolically, I want to be real honest. We've seen a movement that has been, um, has grown rapidly um, and also a movement that is trying to develop 
um, what it can see itself as um, beyond just resisting. Um, and so something I'm very excited about most recently, the movement for Black, Black Lives developed an like electoral project where we're looking at what is it really gonna take to build Black power and which they're gonna do 50 town halls across the country in black and major black cities to really decide, um, yeah, what what is it what is it gonna take? Um, what are we going to be able to do and how do we get there? Um, and so, you know, when the media at some point, you know, often we've heard the media most recently, mainstream media in particular, say, well, where has Black Lives Matter gone? We haven't gone anywhere because the Black Liberation Movement has never gone anywhere. It's mm-hmm. it's it's about what they decide that becomes a do story. We're gonna be out here whether it's trendy or not to say Black Lives Matter. Absolutely. Thank, thank you for that. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do now is just say for those who are here in, um, in the classroom in person, those who are online, if you have questions, please use the, the Twitter that we've talked about and um, we can then uh, post that um, to, to our, our speaker who's being very, very gracious uh, with the time. Um, so in terms of, 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 of those who are here who are who are advocates and, and see the, themselves as like this is the, you know they're, they're committed to this work you know one of the things that we find is that the, the work itself can be very draining um, emotionally um, you know we talk about there might be you know the concept of racial battle fatigue and, and what that produces for those of us who are engaged in equity oriented work do you what do you do to to maintain really a kind of sense of sanity in, in doing this work and any recommendations that you might have for others who, who you know, this is this is part of our struggle, who are engaged in this work. Um, it's a really good question. <laughs> um, I'm I'm in it right now, trying to figure that out. I, I go, I do the, I do some traditional stuff. I go see a therapist once a week. Um, I also. Um, uh, deeply believe in spirituality and doesn't mean that everybody else has to. So I do a lot of prayer and meditation. Um, and I try to um, really develop my, um, I, I try to ground myself in what's real and what's not real. <laughs> um, and, and try to, um, you know, really challenge my ego as much as possible in this work. Because like I said, one, one minute you're trendy, one minute you're not. Um, one minute, you know, the whole world wants to big you up and the next minute the FBI is going after your, you and your loved ones. So just staying grounded in what's, what's real, um, what's possible, what's necessary. And I ask myself this single question when I wake up every morning, which is, am I changing the material conditions for black people? Um, and that's important because for those of us who, in, who end up getting a lot of visibility, we could sort of have this idea that our visibility is what is helping black people, but that's not true. The visibility only gets you to a certain point. Um, if we're changing the material conditions for black people, that's actually where the work, that, that's for me, that's where the work lies. And I, at six o'clock, I have to hop off. I could take one more question um, and then I got to go into this town hall. Okay, totally understand. So, the, and this is a question uh, that has come in through Twitter. So I'm going to uh, use one of the opportunity to do that. And it says, how do you feel about the ideals and focus of the movement being purposely misinterpreted as a way of trying to debunk it? It's infuriating. It's also historical. Um, so uh, that's where I ground myself in history. It's part of, we have a movement and then they have a movement. And I have to remember that their movement is to um, to discredit us. Their movement is to um, disenfranchise us. Their movement is to um, create as little as possible for black power. Um, our movement is to um, challenge that and build folks up. And so it's infuriating, but it's also historical. I'm not special, nor is our movement. This is what happens when you join this movement. This is um, a part of uh, it's, this is a part of living in America, unfortunately. Um, but it's, um, it's also telling, right? It's telling of the work that we're doing and, and how worried this government is um, and how much it clings on to white supremacy and patriarchy. Absolutely. 
uh, one thing I, I just want to say before you get off is that um, for those who are listening, you have a book coming out, right? Um, that's, Do. That's, uh, and the title of the book again is? When uh, They Call the Terrorist. Yes. So <laughs> hopefully um, we're, we're going to try to set up San Diego to be one of the, the sites on your, on your book tour, which I'm sure. Oh, yay. So, um, but thank you for being so gracious with your time and for the work that you do. For those who are in the room, I hope you can give us a, a round of applause for the incredible work. Thank you so much. Thank you for being patient with me. I know I was supposed to spend a little bit more time with y'all, but um, a big part of my commitment um, since this administration has been to come back home and really do the work locally. So I appreciate y'all just uh, being patient with me. Absolutely. We thank you for your time. and. Um, if there's anything that we can do, you just you just let us know. Um, but we are engaged and we'll continue to be engaged. Okay, sounds good. Okay, you have a good day. Thank you. So just some, some quotes that were coming through uh, via social media um, that I think helped to contextualize some of the, the comments that, that were provided, uh, that basically education spaces of, uh, in terms of talking about education, space of, spaces of care have been turned into spaces of criminalization. And it's interesting, I want you to remember that quote because um, when we go to the lecture, um, linking black um, lives and black minds, you're gonna see that theme come up very strong. Uh, another one that came up, uh, building black power involves having conversations with and among black people. So it's important for us to have, um, for those who are African-American to have those community conversations, but recognize that allies are an important part of black liberation as well. So it cannot occur on our own. If we think about the efforts and advancements of the civil rights movement, think about efforts and advancement um, of so many other movements involving so many other communities, it's not never done alone. It's done in tandem with, with other people who are, are willing to sacrifice their own oftentimes best interests and, and their own time, their own resources, and in some cases their own lives to basically advance those outcomes. And just in, and remembering that, um, their their movement, I spelled that wrong, that should be a, a you have to forgive me there. The how to professor. <laughs> their movement is to create as little as possible for black power. But our movement, I believe, is to respond to what takes place um, with, um, with the goal of fostering love. Because I think that oftentimes, and especially if we think about our current national climate, we're in a climate where our nation is, hasn't been this dark for a very, very long time. And it's not that, that supremacy ha, had evaporated. Supremacy was already always there and already there. But it has become more overt. I do a lot of training on microaggressions, talking about the subtle ways and the subtle, subtle comments in which people make. And I think it's really important for us to keep in mind that a lot of what's taking place now, it's not subtle. It's not microaggressive, it's not unconscious, it's very overt. Just take a look at the, the Twitter feed for this class and look at some of the comments that have been posted since we've been here, right? And you can see that there is a lot of vitriol, that there's a lot of hate, there's a lot of darkness. And our job as educators is again to confront that and see our role and our, our, our spaces, our classrooms, again, our offices, our schoolyards as sites for civil resistance that confronts these societal ills through teaching that demonstrates love. So with that, what we're going to do is end uh, the live session. For those of you who have joined us from your respective sites, thank you for signing on. Thank you for being advocates for our boys and men of color.